Hi there. Right now we're going to carry on to Matthew chapters 6 to 7 in this video. Okay, we want to explore the summaries of chapter 6 and 7 and then in between that I'm going to give you the lessons that relate to each of those chapters. So let's get straight into it. The first thing I want to do is to focus your attention on some of the overview of the chapter. What are some of the things that were emphasized by our Lord Jesus in Matthew chapter 6? So if you turn your Bibles with me, please, to Matthew chapter 6, we'll take a look here. I've got my notebook here that I'm going to use to share my lessons, and I am ready to go. All right, in Matthew chapter 6, our Lord starts by showing us that we must be careful not to do our acts of righteousness before people. Not to do our acts of righteousness before people. And what were the acts of righteousness that our Lord talked about? He talked about giving as an act of righteousness. He talked about prayer as an act of righteousness. And he talked about fasting as an act of righteousness. So what are those? Let's get a little bit deeper into it. Well, giving. We're supposed to give freely and joyfully. The Bible says in the book of 2 Corinthians chapters 8 to and, and 9, actually, it talks about giving there. But in chapter 8, it says, as you have excelled in all these things, make sure also that you excel in giving. God expects us to excel in our giving. The Bible says that we should, God loves a cheerful giver in 2 Corinthians chapter 9. God is telling us right there that he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. He who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one should give what he has proposed in his heart without grudging. Okay? Because why? God loves a cheerful giver. And God will make all grace abound to you, having all that you need at all times and in all things. But the point I want to make here is the Bible teaches us our Lord is teaching us, the first thing he says to us there, is teaching us about giving and he's teaching us about prayer. And we're going to focus on that as a lesson in a moment. It says here, prayer is a powerful way for us to communicate with God. I love one young man was talking about prayer and how we pray or how we should pray. He said that prayer is communication with God and communication is two way. So one person speaks and one person listens and one person replies. So when you go to pray to the Lord, just know that you're supposed to pray, speak your heart to the Lord by his word. And then you need to wait for a response for the Lord to communicate back to you. It's not a one way. We don't go and pray and then go away. Because most of us tend to do that. We go and pray even when God is speaking. It's like, oh, 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 I'm telling you something. You don't want to listen anymore because you've walked away. Because you're not enjoying the two-way communication that is what our Lord wants. Okay, what about, what else can we say about prayer there? Prayer makes you grow in your faith and prayer guarantees that you're going to hear God's wisdom. Prayer is a powerful thing. You know, you cannot survive your Christian walk without praying. Um, there's a saying that if you want to grow, there's a song actually, uh, it says, you know, read your Bible, pray every day, read your Bible, pray every day if you want to grow. What, a, what an awesome wisdom that is. That, uh, you know, if you truly, if you read your Bible first, because then you get faith, then you use your faith to pray, and then you, you, you use your prayer to get the result. You, you read the Bible to get faith. You don't get faith because you pray. No, you get faith because you read your Bible. So the Bible tells us in the book of Romans chapter 10, it tells us that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So you hear the word of God, then you use the word of God to pray. Because you don't know God's will unless you read his word. So you read his word, you know his will, then you pray about his will, then you get the results of his will, okay? That's what should be happening. So prayer helps us to communicate with God. Prayer also helps us to grow and to understand God's wisdom. What about fasting? I'm not talking about fasting. Fasting is our spiritual need, is a spiritual need, and it helps us to seek God's guidance by 
by fasting, it teaches us for self-discipline and self-control. Fasting teaches us self-discipline and self-control. And if you want to learn, it's the only place actually that I know of a teaching about fasting in the Bible. Of course, I'm, I'm not saying that, the, <laughs> please don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that the Bible does not teach us about fasting. That's not what I said. I said that there is one chapter of the Bible that teaches a lot about how to fast. And that chapter, sometimes we see examples of fasting or fasting is mentioned to us. Uh, the Bible tells us in the book of Acts uh, 13, for example, that the, the apostles and the teachers of the time in, in the church, after they fasted and prayed, the Lord said, separate for me Paul and Barnabas for the work to which I've called them. So that's an example of a fast. We know that Daniel fasted. We know that David fasted. We know that um, actually it was by law. You got to fast on the day of atonement, I think. You got to uh, withhold yourself from food. So there was that, that was the only fast that God uh, gave to children of Israel. But they had so many other fastings that they did. Anyway, um, uh, so we understand the fasting, but Isaiah 58 from verses 1 to 11 teaches us a lot about fasting. So if you want to learn a little bit more about fasting, please go and read Isaiah 58 verses 1 to 11. All right, so we can see about fasting in chapter 6 there. And then it says, do not be like the hypocrites. Hypocrites, when they pray, they pray this long prayer so that everybody can see them. We, we should pray, give, and fast in humility. We should not be like the hypocrites because they've received whatever they wanted. There's so many things in that chapter 6 of the book of Matthew. But then it goes on to talk about, actually, we need to read this. Let me read um, another section of the book of Matthew for you. Chapter 6 says, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth. Verse 19 where moths and, and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But store for yourselves treasures in heaven, where moths and rust do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Where your treasure is. The things that you have labored on. Let's not only labor to get material things. Let's labor to get spiritual things. One of the greatest spiritual things that I believe that you and I can get is to make disciples. In your making disciples, you are really storing up for yourself treasures in heaven. That's my belief. Because it's difficult to make disciples. It's difficult for you to pour your life into someone else. That's why most people do not engage in discipleship. But what Lord is teaching us here, it says, you know what? You need to lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. All right. Then he moves on to the famous, one of the most famous parts of the Bible anyway. Uh, do not worry. Do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Let me read that part of the Bible for you. In Matthew, turn over your Bible to Matthew chapter 6. I want to show you something here. In Matthew chapter 6, verses 33 and 34, it says, watch this, it says, But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, his way of doing things, okay? And all these things will be given to you as well. Why? Therefore... Do not worry about tomorrow. Why? For tomorrow will worry about itself. Think about that for a moment. Do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Then it says something so profound, our Lord. It says, each day has enough trouble of its own. So two things I want to pull out for, for you from those verses. Do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow has enough, has, so, so tomorrow, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. God has put a mechanism into the day that the day will worry for itself. Wow. Tomorrow will worry for itself. God has put a mechanism into tomorrow, into the next 24 hours, that the next 24 hours is always trying to solve the problems that it faces. 
There's a mechanism for each day to try and resolve the problems that that day will face. God has already made it so. Then it says something else. It says, each day has enough trouble of its own. Why does it say that? Because when you and I are worrying, we are adding to the trouble of tomorrow. Let me say that again. When you and I are worrying, we are adding to the trouble of tomorrow. So don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Why? For each day has enough trouble of its own. God is saying to us, don't add to the trouble of tomorrow <laughs> by worrying. Worrying as trouble for so, so so when we're worrying, I'm speaking to myself. I don't know about you, but I'm speaking to myself. When when I'm then worried, I'm adding more problems for the next day. Wow. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. All right. So let's go on here. So I have a lesson that I want to share with you now. And the lesson I want to share with you is from Matthew chapter 16. So let I uh, beg your pardon. Matthew chapter 6. We're going to look at verse 9. Matthew chapter 6. We are going to look at verse 9, which is the famous Our Lord's Prayer. So let's read it first. Matthew chapter 6, verse 9. Then this is how you should pray. I want to talk to us about how we should pray. Look at what it says. Our Father in heaven, hallowed your name. Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done. On earth, I says in heaven, give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we also forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. So, what do I want to say? I want to talk about a few things in relation to that particular prayer. Uh, uh, you know, most, most times you hear people, particularly in the movies, Hollywood have done this so many times, they start just reciting the Lord's Prayer. Something happens to someone in the movies and they start reciting the prayer. And I guess we, some people do that as a, as a natural instinct when something is going on in their lives. They, they just recite the Lord's Prayer. I think the Lord was teaching us more than just reciting that Lord's Prayer. I think there's a lot more there. When we start praying, the way to, I think this is a way to pray, as opposed to us just regurgitating the words in that uh, particular section of scripture. I think our Lord is teaching us, this is how you should pray. I want you first to acknowledge God as Father. Not, not as God, but acknowledge God as Father. And a Father is there to ensure that he helps you to meet your needs, he helps, he, he protects you, he watches over you, he guides you, he gives you good advice. Just think about what a good father would do. That's how Jesus is saying to us, I want you to start relating to God as father. And the, I'm sure the people of the time never related to God in that way. So he was telling them, he's telling us, telling me and telling you, start relating to God as father. That's number one. The second thing is, I want you to honor his name. I want you to look at God and say, Lord, I just thank you because of all these great things you have done, all these great, all these great traits that you have. You are loving, you are merciful. Lord, you are a God of justice. Lord, I thank you because you are full of love. You are full of, you are, you are full of joy. You know what, you, what, you want to honor God. You are all powerful, you are all sovereign. Thank you, Lord. You know all things. There is nothing that exists without you. You are acknowledged. You are honoring God as part of your prayer. You must honor God as part of your prayer. Then I want you to realize that his, his rule is perfect. Look at what he says in that particular portion of scripture. He says, your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Oh, wow. Amazing. Every time I read that scripture, it reminds me that God's will is always done on, in heaven. God's will is always done in heaven. However, his will is not always done on earth unless we require it and we request it and we are open to it. Let me say that again. God's will is always done in heaven, but God's will is not always done on earth 
except that we invite him. The Bible tells us that the earth he has given to man. So God now needs our invitation for him to operate on earth. I, I, know, I know that sounds strange because we just think that God will just do whatever he wants to do on earth. God will just do whatever. No, it, it doesn't work that way. It doesn't, you will notice it doesn't work that way. God can and probably even occasionally does because, uh, okay, if, if we think about how God delivered the children of Israel, they never asked him to deliver them. Well, they did ask, actually. They asked him to deliver them. They didn't, never asked him to deliver them that way. But he chose to deliver them because he had a covenant already with Abraham. And he had already promised Abraham. And Abraham had received that, his reception of the promise. Made, the Bible tells us that this was accredited to him as righteousness. Abraham's uh, uh, agreeing, accepting the promise, believing, putting his faith in the promise, ensured that God would deliver the children of Israel. So therefore, we cannot even say God just did whatever he liked. No, God proposed to Abraham. Abraham accepted the promise by faith and it was credited to him as righteousness. Therefore, God came to deliver the children of Israel. Um, I said all that to make you to understand that you got to invite God into your situation. You got to invite God into your situation. Next point, it says, give us this day our daily bread. What's our daily bread? Our physical needs, right? What's our daily bread? Our emotional needs. What's our daily bread? Our spiritual needs. Our uh, uh, whatever necessities we have. We're looking to God. Even though you're going to work and you are laboring and you're working, you are still looking to God as the ultimate supplier. So therefore, when your boss upsets you, you're not looking to him or her as the ultimate provider for you. You're looking to God as your provider. What's that? That's just amazing. Then it says uh, that, look at what it says here. It says, and forgive us our debts as we forgive those who sin against us as we forgive our debtors. Lord, I, I just want to pray right now. Lord, help me to be a forgiving person. Lord, help me to forgive those who sin against me. Help me, oh God, because I know that's the same way you're going to forgive me. So you, you, you and I want to be walking in forgiveness. We want to be walking in forgiveness all the time. And then finally, I want to thank God for leading us away and lead us not into temptation. When we hear that, we think that God is the one leading us to temptation. So we're begging him. Oh God, please don't lead me into temptation. That's not what the scripture is saying. The scripture is not saying God is the one leading into temptation. Therefore, you're begging God, don't lead me into temptation, Lord. No, 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 no. It is the devil that tempts us. Look, with this prayer here is saying, Lord, lead us away from temptation, the traps that the enemy has set for us, deliver us from his schemes. Deliver us from the schemes of the enemy. That's what this is saying. It's not saying it's God that is tempting you. God doesn't tempt us. The Bible says in the book of James chapter 1, God doesn't, God doesn't tempt us. That can he be tempted by evil. Each one is tempted when by his own evil desire. It's because of our own evil desire is that the enemy comes and finds something to use. Jesus said that Satan comes and finds nothing in me. He can't find anything to use in the life of the Lord. But if he comes into us, he might find something to use. But we are praying, oh Lord, deliver us from temptation. The Bible says that, but when you are tempted, God is able to make an, a way of escape so that you can stand up under it. God will not allow you to be tempted more than you can bear. In, in all of it, he will give you, he will give you a way. He will make a way for you to be able to stand up. It's not God tempting you. God is the one that is rescuing you. Come on. <laughs> oh my goodness. Sometimes people think it's God tempting them. No, it's the devil that tempts us. God tests us. Doesn't tempt us. All right. Okay. So <laughs> I'm going to leave that there. So let's go on to take a look at chapter 7. Let's take a look at chapter 7. Okay. 
So, here we go. Chapter 7, an overview of chapter 7. It starts by looking at or talking about judgment, not judging others. Do not judge or you too will be judged. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come back to that in a moment. But also, uh, as I got in my notes, the, the, the scripture here in this chapter talks about how we should build. And it talks about uh, wolves in sheep clothing. It talks about the narrow gates. Okay, let's go back to that judgment. Let's take a look at it. So it says in verse 1, do not judge or you will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. Why do you look at a speck of sawdust in your brother's eye? What, I love the way the NLT puts it. It says, why don't you first take out the telephone post that is in your own eye? You've got to consider what's going on in your life first. Ah, man. Thank you, Lord. So when the Bible says... The greatest commandments are, what is it? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. If you love yourself, you will notice that there's still areas of your life that you're trusting God to change. And as you are trusting God to change those areas of your life, you use that same kind of empathy to judge someone else. I know here in Matthew 7 it says, do not judge or you too will be judged, but... Let's be careful not to use that as a cop-out to get out of people being able to advise us and talk to us. Because also in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul says that, are we not to judge the believers? God will judge the unbelievers. The problem is that we keep judging the unbelievers as, as Christians. It's not your job. It's not your place to judge an unbeliever. Actually, you should sympathize with, with a non-believer because after all, most of us were unbelievers before we became believers. Somebody said, well, I was born in a Christian home. That doesn't make you a believer anyway, just because you were born in a Christian home. Your parents, yeah, 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 I, I know, I know. Some of you stopped. It's like, what do you mean? Yeah, that's what I mean. Just because you're born in a Christian home does not make you born again. You've got to decide when you got, when you became of age, You've got to decide that you are going to give your life to Christ, not being under your parents' covering all the time and say, well, because a time comes when, yeah, because you're born in a Christian home, your parents' righteousness covers you to a point. We know that in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. However, there comes a time where you have to decide yourself anyway. <laughs> all right, so we're still looking at this here. says, when you judge, in 1 Corinthians 5, it says that God will judge the unbeliever. Then, it goes on here in chapter 7 of the book of Matthew, ask. You know, it's interesting, it's, it's very interesting that the word ask actually also stands as an acronym for what Jesus is talking about next. So, A is ask and you will receive, uh, uh, S is seek and you would find, and K is knock and the door will be open. Amazing, amazing how the scripture works. Then we come into the narrow gate and the wide gate. Oh, that's amazing. The narrow gate and the wide gate. Sometimes a lot of people are going down a particular path and it's easier for us to just be part of it. You know, in the book of, uh, the, in the book of Acts, it tells us that there was a riot going on and it says that even some people didn't know why they were there. They didn't know why, because everybody's there, so they also go there. That's what we are like sometimes, just follow what everybody's doing. If, there's, if there is a queue here, uh, and this lane is empty, we still follow the road that has the queue, because we stay where everybody's staying. We like to follow people, and sometimes, spiritually, we are like that. And we're supposed to come out of that. We should seek the narrow path, the way of the Lord. Not necessarily that it's overly difficult, but it's the narrow path. It's the way, it says, look, look at what it says about the narrow path. It says, enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it, but small is the gate. And narrow is the road that needs to life. And only a few people find, 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 find it. We need to find the road. We find the way of the Lord. Through prayer, we find the way of the Lord. Then it goes on to tell us about wolves 
in sheep clothing. People coming to you as though they are righteous when they are really ferocious wolves. Look at uh, in the book of 1 Kings chapter 12 where the prophet from Judah comes to pronounce judgment on Jeroboam. And as he pronounced that judgment, Jeroboam, then he healed Jeroboam as well. Jeroboam said, I'll oh, come to my house, you know, let me give you some food. And, uh, and, and he said, you know what, well, God told me not to go to anybody's house to eat and definitely not to go the way I came. And then this ferocious wolf, uh, I would say, prophet comes and says, oh, an angel appeared to me and God told me to tell you to come to my house. He was lying to him, but the man couldn't say it and he uh, disobeyed God. Anyway, so, and then finally, it looks at how we should build. Building on the rock so that when trying times come, we're able to stand. All right. So what's the lesson that I have for you today on this? What lesson do I have for you in, in chapter 7? I want to talk about how we should give advice. I want to talk about that. Look, the Bible says in verse 6, and this is in verse 6. This is a lesson I have for you in chapter 7. Is chapter 7, verse 6. It says, do not give dogs what is sacred. Do not throw your pearls to pigs. If you do, they may trample them down under their feet and turn and tear you to pieces. And I want to use that to suggest... Watch how you give advice. Be cautious with advice. Be wise in the way you give advice. Sometimes you should not advise certain people. You should just leave them be. Just let them be. Because they are not ready to listen to the advice. Because they will soon turn that advice round on your head and it will be that you have a problem. They're going to make out like you have a problem because you're trying to advise them. So, if you have something to say, say it once and leave it. Some people, you should stay on their back because they're open to advice and they're trying and they want to learn. When, when somebody displays to you that they're not interested in learning, do not argue with such person. That is like throwing your pearls before swines. Throwing your pearls before dogs. Look at what it says here. It says, do not give dogs what is sacred. Do not throw your pearls to pigs. If you do, they will trample under, they will trample them under their feet and then turn and tear you to pieces. So, you and I also need to be very selective with the people we seek advice from as well. And not everyone has our best interest at heart. That's very true. And then finally, it says in that slide right there, be, care, be ready to listen and learn and grow from the advice of wise and godly individuals in your life. So what you and I need to do as well, so, so that we are not, uh, um, I, I suppose, we do not, show ourselves to be those who do not take advice, we need to make sure we listen when somebody is giving us advice. We need to make sure we listen to godly people that he has put around us so that we do not become like the dogs and the pigs that will trample on good wisdom. All right. I'm going to stop there and I'll see you in chapter 8 of the book of Matthew. Get excited. See you soon. Bye-bye.